6. 1 Kings chapter 6. We are now doing our daily Bible reading. Going through 1 Kings. Uh, we are on chapter 6 this morning, and I will read from verse 1 to verse 13. In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. The house that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The vestibule in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits long, equal to the width of the house, and 10 cubits deep in front of the house, and he made for the house windows with recessed frames. He also built a structure against the wall of the house, running around the walls of the house, both the nave and the inner sanctuary. And he made side chambers all around, and lowest story was five cubits broad, the middle one was six cubits broad, and the third one was seven cubits broad. For around the outside of the house he made offsets on the wall in order that the supporting beams should not be inserted into the walls of the house. When the house was built, it was with stone prepared at the quarry so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the house while it was being built. The entrance for the lowest story was on the south side of the house and one went up by stairs to the middle story and from the middle story to the third. So he built the house and finished it and he made the ceiling of the house of beams and planks of cedar. He built the structure against the whole house, five cubits high, and it was joined at the house with timbers of cedar. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon, concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people, Israel. So now we have the story of Solomon building the temple of God, uh, starting in the fourth year of his reign. Um, And this obviously is a, a event that sits very clearly in the history of the Old Testament Israel. Uh, it's well dated as well because there's also a specific dates or years that are uh, referred to in verse 1. Um, and as we read the story of Solomon's building of the temple, uh, we have to realize that this is all happening uh, from the background of what we read in the first and the second Samuel, especially second Samuel. The reason why David, not Solomon, but David, Solomon's father, first conceived this idea that I need to build a house for God. I need to build a building for God. And you might wonder, why? Why did David have that thought in his mind? And this we find in 2 Samuel chapter 7. I I think I already uh, conveyed to you last Sunday that it's probably the same author or group of historians who wrote together the 1st, 2nd Samuel and 1st, 2nd Kings. So they all come together as one book. So, you know, the theme or the, the recurring theme that connects all these together is not a surprise. It's, it's obviously there before a reason because it's the same author trying to make a point. And uh, chapter 7 of 2nd Samuel, verse 1 This is what it says, now when the king, David, lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. Okay, so what's going on? You see, David now is a king of Israel, the whole Israel, but not only the whole of Israel, but all the surrounding nations submitted under him. 
So now there was no enemy at all trying to overtake David, which means that now the, finally the years of peace have come upon the nation of Israel. And as David was established firmly as the king of Israel, something else happened. Somebody built his palace for him. And the name of the gentleman is Hiram. Uh, Hiram of, of Tyre, Tyre. It's a T-Y-R-E. That's the name of a, a country north of, uh, of Israel. And this Hiram became a great friend to David. And one act of love and devotion to this uh, a brother, this king, David, was that he actually uh, supplied uh, the famous Leb- Lebanese cedars. Uh, that, that's sort of, a, there's a phrase, isn't it, in the Old Testament, the cedar of Lebanon, which means the best of all, the greatest uh, 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 wood material that, that could be used in building buildings. So these beautiful cedars were uh, supplied to David into Jerusalem to build these uh, buildings, right, for David. And not only that, he uh, sent people who are skilled in working with wood, carpenters in other, other words, and also the stone workers, the people who could you know, cut the stones and move the stones, and all these great technicians and, and artists were sent along with these wood, these trees, and uh, these beams, and, and he was able to build his house for his good friend whom he honored as his own king, namely David. David was now living in this brand new palace for himself, built by the best thing that was available in those days. And he's looking down from his window up high in in, in his palace, and what does he see? He sees a tent. Now, what is that tent? Well, it's the tabernacle. Remember, tabernacle? What God had told Moses to build? When Moses met God on Mount Sinai in the beginning of the 40 years of the wilderness journey, and as God gave him the design for the tabernacle, the tabernacle was really a copy, a copy, an earthly copy of something much, much infinitely more grand in the heavenly court of God, the Holy of Holies, where God is enthroned. Anyway, the tabernacle, nevertheless, was a very simple-looking tent with two compartments and a yard around it. So this tent was still standing. I'm sure they had to do some mending over the years, but it was really tent made not with bricks, not with stones, not with woods, but tent made with fabrics, essentially. Strong fabrics, yes, I'm sure, but nevertheless, fabrics. And uh, in chapter 6 of uh, 2 Samuel, uh, that great event of now, finally, the Ark of the Covenant being brought up to Jerusalem, as David so desired it, he tried it once, he failed, because it was done the wrong way. The second time, it was finally there, and David was so joyful, he was dancing for joy, even to a point where his wife was a little embarrassed about his body, the nakedness showing because he was dancing so hard. Remember that story? That's just in that previous chapter of 2 Samuel 6. And finally in 2 Samuel 7, the Ark of the Covenant is inside the tent, but it is sad compared to where he is now living in. The throne of David was inside a palace. The throne of God was inside a tent. Because you know that the Ark of the Covenant was not just merely a box. On top of the box, there was a seat. And Israelites knew that as that Ark of Covenant was seated inside the Holy of Holies, the deepest part where nobody can go in except the high priest once a year with the blood of atonement. That seat was called the throne of God or mercy seat. Again, Tabernacle was a replica, or I guess more like a miniature, of the real thing in heaven where God is enthroned. And you see a glimpse of that by description in Revelation chapter 4. And already in the Old Testament, God, who is enthroned in the heavenly place, gave a model, a replica, a small mini model for Israel to have. David's feeling like, well, you know what? 
if we're going to have a tabernacle, we're going to have a temple of God standing in our midst, it's got to be better than my own house. It's got to be better than my palace. It's got to be bigger than my palace. It cannot sit in a small tent. So his heart was moved, and he said, Lord God, I'm going to build a house for you, a grand house, that all people will know that you are the God of Israel. You are the king of Israel. I am a, a, a vessel king. I'm your prime minister. I'm not the king. You are the king. So I'm going to establish your kingship this way by building a beautiful palace sitting at the top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. That's why this temple story even begins. You know? Building a building sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds actually a, a, like a huge innovation, but when you think about it, uh, there's a bit of a, a downside to it because tabernacle was a movable tent. It was not fixed in one location. That's why through the 40 years of journey, they were able to move along with this tent, this temple of God that, that followed or that actually led the people all around the journey, all the way into Jerusalem, all the way into the land of Canaan. Mobile temple. <laughs> Why? Because God is a God who is absolutely free. God is not fixed somewhere. God is universally present. God is enthroned in the highest point of all reality. And this God, can you imagine? To be fixed in a little building in a one location? I mean, to think about God in the heavenly throne... And where are we in the solar system is nothing but a teeny little system in the entire universe. We're just one among billions. I don't even know how many. Inside this solar system, there's this teeny little planet called Earth. And on this Earth, a teeny little piece of land called Palestine. And that teeny little piece of land called Palestine, there's a teeny little plot of land called Jerusalem, and on that plot of land, a teeny little peak, not even like a huge mountains that you know of, small mountain top, to build a house there and say, God lives here? You know, how much of a disservice is this? So this building this house thing is, is really, uh, we might misunderstand it as a great uh, innovation, but it's actually detrimental to really knowing who God is, what kind of God we serve. He's not contained inside man-made uh, man house. That's exactly what God says to David. God says, you build a house for me? God said, you know what? Uh, I will build your house, meaning that I will build a dynasty for you. Your house, your family will be great before me because I will bless you. Your son shall reign forever and ever. And God there is promising the son of David, meaning the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who comes as the king of kings, will reign forever. God gives that promise. And God also said, well, you know what? Uh, I'll concede. I'll make a concession. God makes a lot of concessions in the Old Testament because he loves his people. God said, well, if this will help them to know that I am in their midst, that I am a God who is present with my people, then what I'll do is I'll let you build a house, but you will not do it. Your son will do it. Solomon will do it. And David used the remainder of his life, life to prepare for this house so all the materials, all the designs, and everything he put together so that his son, Solomon, can build this temple. That's what this is about. The temple of God. Uh, but the point that I really want to point out to you as really the, the one-point sermon that I'm going to give you, in a sense, is this strangeness in the narrative of the first kings that uh, uh, there, there, there is something that seems a bit odd in the presentation and I think this is very deliberate I think the historian is is really trying to say something here the story of temple building goes from Chapter 5 of 1 King, all the way to the end of chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a long chapter. 
So at the end of chapter 7, verse 51 says, Thus all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished. Finally, it was done. It was completed. So it takes that many chapters to cover it, beginning from chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. But right in the middle of this narrative, in chapter, chapter 7, verse 1, you have this very odd, odd statement. It says, Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. So, placed inside this story of temple building, and temple is the palace for God, right? The true king. The story goes from chapter 6 to the end of chapter 7. Right in the middle of it, there is a story of Solomon building his own palace. Verse 1 I believe, going down to verse 12. So, I think this is very deliberate on the part of the historian. Uh, it's, it's a bit odd that it's placed that way. And, and, and when you think about it, um, uh, it's, it's kind of weird that how long did it take for the temple to be built? Seven years, right? It says seven years. Solomon built a temple for seven years. Chapter 6 Chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7, the end of chapter 7. But right in the middle, there is what? Solomon building his own palace for how many years? Well, if you read it last week, 13 years. So isn't it weird to contain an event that took actually longer than the whole event that is containing this story within it? It's very deliberate. It's very deliberate from the narrative standpoint that to raise an eyebrow, to raise a sense of alarm, to raise a sense that this is unnatural, something is not quite right. But we'll, we'll, we'll focus on that a little bit, okay? So again, what is the temple of God? Temple is God's palace. We established that already. And who is God then? Who is God in Israel? God is the only king of Israel. He is the unique king over all things, all things. What God said to Solomon, chapter 6, verse 11. Uh, let's go to verse 13. The temple is none other than the dwelling place of God, right? So God said, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. This is, again, God's concession. God is saying, you know what? Yes, okay, I will let you build my temple. And that means that uh, you will know visibly that I am with you, that you know that this is a building where I place my name on. Doesn't mean that I'm trapped in the building. Doesn't mean that I only stay there. I am the, the God of the universe. In fact, uh, there's nothing escape. There's nothing in the world that ever escapes my eyes. My, my, my perception, I see all things. Yet, I will make this building unique in that it holds, it, it, it bears my name. And uh, every time you look at the building, no matter where you are, even every time you remember the building, even though you may be far away, you will know that I am God who is with my people. I dwell in the midst of my people. That being the temple and God being enthroned in this temple. What kind of person is God? What kind of being is God? God is the absolute king. He's the absolute one. Verse 12, concerning this house that you are building. Well, God talks very little about the house, but he talks about this. If you walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you. In other words, what God is saying is that it's not enough that you have a building for me. That building, yes, it's a symbol of my, my presence with you. But the important thing is that you understand who I am. I am the king. And you listen to me. He's not talking to people generally. He's talking to Solomon. You. If you walk on my, in my statutes, obey my rules, and keep all my commandments, and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you. My promise to you will come true. 
Solomon, don't, don't forget who I am. I am the king to whom you will listen. Okay, then the third question that we might have, well, what is the temple? Who is God? Number three, then, who is Solomon? Who is Solomon? Solomon is a king, isn't he? But what is, a, what is the meaning of a king in the case of Solomon? You see, when people of Israel demanded a king to Samuel, this goes back to 1 Samuel, uh, the book of 1 Samuel, uh, People asked for a king, and they said, we would like to have a king just like all the other nations. And they, they didn't quite know what they're asking, but they wanted somebody that could lead them, someone that could visibly fight for them. So they're looking for a savior. And then this request was very upsetting for Samuel, because Samuel felt that he was being rejected. And then God uh, spoke to Samuel, and God said, Samuel, Samuel, don't be so upset. This, don't take this personally, because they did not reject you. They rejected me as their king. So that issue is highlighted in the very beginning of the narration of this history of Israel. They inquired, they requested a king, and in doing so, they have forgotten the fact that God is their king. Israel is unique. Israel is different because the Lord God is their king, and the Lord God is not an absent king, but he's in their midst. He rules over them, and the very throne room of God was in the tabernacle. They forgot. Yet, God makes concession again. God said, okay, we'll give them a king. So finally, Saul was... was uh, uh, anointed as the first king of Israel, and there's the scene when Solomon, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Samuel was presenting Saul as their king. Behold your king, here's the king. And there, Solomon's speaking the word of God, and God said, well, here's your king. If you obey my word, if you obey my commandments, you shall go well. But there it's very clear. God says, not only the people, but king, you too. You see, uh, the, the important point is, in a typical, typical uh, uh, makeup of a, of a power structure, you'll have a king here and the people, right? The line goes between the king and the people. But in Israel, it's not the same way. Here's God and the line, and under the line, king and the people. Because this king is not an absolute king. This king does not hold an absolute power. God does. God is the absolute Lord. This king is a vessel king. This king is a representation. A better word to describe this king's role, I would think, the Bible talks about, is a royal priesthood. Royal because you somehow are delegated or, or, or appointed by the king himself. Like a prime minister, where there's a king. You are a representation, however. You are royal. You're like my children, yet you do not rule as the absolute power, but rather you represent me to the people. That's what a priest does. Priest represents God to the people, and the priest represents to God the needs of the people, vice versa. It goes both ways. Solomon is like a royal priest. That's his role. He's a prime minister. He's not the king in the same way as God is the king. Why am I uh, making this point uh, to you is because what I see in this narrative is the very contradiction of this line of authority. You know, we believe that Solomon is doing a good thing by building the temple of God. But remember what I said last Sunday. First Kings, the writer, the historians, is, is presenting to us this clear presence of attention. Solomon seems to be doing well, but on the other hand, Solomon seems to be doing badly. Solomon is not a perfect king. In fact, Solomon is a flawed king. And again, even in this act of building the temple of God, Solomon is acting in a strange way. 
The writer is very intentional. Solomon wants to be like God. At least that seems to be in his mind. Why do we have this this overlapping story? On one hand, there's the building of the temple, and right in the midst of the building of the temple, there's the building of Solomon's palace. Remember, the temple is God's palace, and Solomon is building his own palace right in the middle of that story. Why? Well, first of all, uh, I think I think what Solomon, what by doing this, the writer is showing is that I want to I want to compare and contrast these two buildings. I want to see them side by side. That's one intention. The second intention is I want you to see the heart of Solomon as he's doing this. What's at the heart? What's going on at the heart of Solomon? Okay. What we see in that is Solomon is trying to be at par with God. Well, you might think, oh, no, he would never do that. But this is it. This is the hidden motive. This is what is hidden inside the larger project. He's doing this glorious work for God. God, I'm doing this for you. But right smack in the middle of it, he's doing something for himself. There's a self-promotion going on at the same time as he's promoting God. And he's trying to make everything almost the same. In fact, ironically, Solomon's temple is far bigger than God's temple. Look at it, the size. The temple is 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Well, uh, the the, the scale cubit is, is going to throw you off. I mean, we don't use cubits, but cubit, a cubit, is basically 1.5 or one and a half feet. Okay, you know what a foot is, foot and half, right? That's one cubit. So 30 cubits high will be 45 feet high, right? In our, in our own measure. That's about four story building, four, four and a half story. Each story maybe about 10 feet in our buildings today. So you could kind of imagine how high that is, right? And we read that inside the temple, there are three stories, so it roughly fits, three high stories. So... That's how high it is, 30 cubits, 45 feet, okay? 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. How about Solomon's temple or Solomon's palace? It says 100 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Now, I'm not going to fuss about the size, really, because, I mean, you could say that, well, temple is, is like, a, like a center where the religious activities happen. Temple, by the way, is far more complex than a tabernacle. Tabernacle was essentially two rooms. Now, the temple had many, many small rooms. So it, it, it had all the rooms necessary to, to contain uh, a workspace for priests, the Levites, and maybe even some storage space and all that. So it was a one full set of the, the religious center. So in that sense, it was a complex building. But you, you, can, you can say, you know, when a king is, is reigning over a nation or, or that entire great uh, territory that was under his reign, there must be a whole lot of things going on. So he needs a lot of administrative space. Okay, given that. What doesn't jive in my heart, what what really gives me trouble is the fact that they were of the same height. If if that doesn't trouble you, I I guess maybe you could come and tell me why it doesn't trouble you, but it kind of troubles me. It troubles me the fact that when Solomon built his own palace, he made the palace at the same height as God's, God's palace. You also know God's palace took seven years, but Solomon's palace took 13 years. Again, strange narrative. 13 years is contained within seven years. The writer is obviously trying to make a point. He's he's squeezing this into this narrative so that we will know that there's something going on here that's not very natural. Uh, one other thing that troubles me, uh, if you could see it, is that the comparison, right? So from chapter 7, verse 1 to verse 12, the materials are the same. It's okay, same material Solomon used to build his own palace as God's 
palace. And there are some points where things are very deliberately the same. Okay. I'm going to point you to chapter 7, verse 12. The great court had three courses of cut stones all around and a course of cedar beams. So had the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule of the house. So it, it, it's, it's, it's stated, it's translated in such a way that it doesn't seem so striking to you. But if you read in its, its, its context, what it's saying is, what Solomon did, he made this, this inner court inside the building, and he made it just like the court inside the temple. All the columns and all the displays, Solomon made his own palace just like the temple of God. If this doesn't trouble you, I don't know what should trouble you. I think this troubles me. Because what I see in Solomon's narrative here is the fallenness of Adam. Remember what Satan said to Adam and Eve? Well, we think it's Eve, the only one who heard it. I, I think Adam was there too, in a sense. Adam wasn't absent. The serpent said, eat of this tree. Eat the fruit of this tree. Because when you eat of it, you shall be like God. And he or she beheld the fruit and it looked good. Okay, I'll take it. To be like God. Solomon seemed like a great king who has everything together at this point, but I think the writer clearly understand where this is going because at the heart of Solomon is that fallenness of Adam. That he is the one who has eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Solomon is not innocent. Solomon is not straight towards God. Solomon is twisted in his heart while he says, I do this great work for you, O God. But at the heart, he's promoting himself even greater than what God is and does. Wow. Now I have to get to the most important part. But again, the time is short. This is where I always get stuck. Because where's our hope? You know, a lot of us might think, we've got to build a temple like Solomon. I'll tell you what, no, you don't, you don't want to build a temple like Solomon. There's no hope in Solomon. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, the true Solomon. Our hope is in Jesus who came to fulfill that, that building of the temple of God. Jesus came to build the temple of God. And the temple that he built was what? John chapter 1. He himself is the temple. The Word of God, the person of God, came to us and He tabernacled among us. He templed among us. Jesus is God's temple. He is the temple itself for Himself. In fact, in the next chapter of John, when Jesus said, destroy this temple, as He looked at the physical, impressive-looking Herod's temple, which is the second temple, not this temple, but the second temple. Jesus said, destroy it and I'll rebuild it in three days. And people thought that was ridiculous. And John, the apostle, clearly says he was not talking about the physical, material building. He's talking about his own body. Jesus is the builder of the true temple. And Jesus being the head, Jesus being the cornerstone, and we together are built along with him into the temple of God. Ephesians. Paul understood that Jesus is the builder of the real temple. And then real temple is none other than the church. It's not the building. It's you and me, the faithful, the confessors like Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of living God. When you assess who Jesus is and when you speak the truth about Christ like what you did at the confirmation, 
You are it, Lord. You are my king. You and I, we are built into the temple of God where the Holy Spirit is enthroned in our midst. This is the temple. And this is the temple, the true temple, not the hypocritical half temple. Not a temple that is none other than I want to be like God. But a true temple of Jesus Christ. This is you and me. There's the hope. There's our affirmation. We don't need to build our own temple. We don't need to build our own palace. We are royal priests. We are royal. We're sons and daughters of God. You are so precious before God's eyes. Don't ever underestimate that. You see, what's so beautiful about the gospel is that gospel always tells us how sinful we are. How wrong we are outside of the grace of God as children of Adam. We are self-promoting, prideful beings outside of the grace of God. We are lost. But the gospel always says... God's love and grace for us is far greater than our sins. We don't need to affirm ourselves. We don't need to prove ourselves. We don't need to go do the business of affirming how wonderful we are because we are already wonderful in the grace of God, in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the true builder of the temple, invited you and me to be part of this perfect temple of God. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. He is the Lord, and we are the vicegerents. We are the royal priests offering a worship of sacrifice, a praise, prayer, our heart's commitment to him in faith. Our great Lord Jesus Christ went out to wilderness led by the Holy Spirit, and the same Satan that tempted Adam and Eve, came to Jesus, and he tempted Christ about food. It's all about eating, isn't it? Isn't it incredible what Solomon ate? Did you read that in chapter 5 of First King? It's all about food, 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 how wonderful he was supplied with earthly food. But when Jesus was told after 40 years of fasting, you can turn this stone into bread. And Jesus said, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word coming from the mouth of God. Exactly what God said to Solomon, if you listen to me, I will keep my promise to you. I trust in God's promise. And it's The same Satan who came to Jesus and said, why don't you throw yourself down from the pinnacle of this temple and let the angels carry you? Why don't you prove yourself? And Jesus said, as I trust in the word of God, I don't need to prove myself, for the word says, do not test your God. And when Satan said, look at the glory of the whole world, They're yours if you bow down to me. And Jesus said, it is written, worship God and serve him alone. Only he. He is the only God. See, Jesus is not just a better Solomon. He is anti-Solomon. He's the other flip side of the Solomon. He is the true Solomon. Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Brothers and sisters, I think deep inside we have this symptom. We do. The sin in us says proving ourselves is the greatest need. You make money, you get a better job, you need to be appreciated. Even sometimes in the church you do the work, and if you're not appreciated, you get very upset. People get elected as officers, and sometimes one of the worst things that happens is becoming somebody that publicly acknowledge you no longer are able to bear any public criticisms. You want to be invincible. You want to be absolutely perfect as Solomon built his palace to be perfect, as it says. That's precisely where we go wrong. But there's hope. 
The hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's already done it for us. He's already it. And in Jesus Christ, as the very living water flows into our hearts, we have the love and the humility and the servanthood of Jesus Christ flowing out of us to bring healing and restoration to your homes, to your friends, to the church, to the world. I hope that you see what the writer seems to be really trying to get us to see, right? I, I want to see that and also see Jesus Christ. That's what we need to see, Christ. And in him is the answer. May the Lord bless you as we lift up Jesus, as we lift up the God of Christ himself, the one and only God. We're not God. He is to worship him, and he's awesome. He's beautiful. I hope that your worship is full of him, not full of yourself. I wish you could forget about yourself, and you could just think about God. I wish that when you come to worship, it's not about your comfort. I wish when you come to worship, you're not thinking about, oh, you know, what do I get out of this? I really pray that you will shed the sins of Adam, but in Jesus Christ, embrace him and walk with him and worship God truly as he deserves it. So I invite you all to stand with me.